All right, welcome. We are now working on part two of the skull, still working in unit four. So let's go on. All right, here we are with an anterior view of the skull. And you can see right here, you've got your frontal bone. Here you can see a little bit of the parietal, which I'm doing in the little P for parietal. There's T for temporal. Okay, good. You've got your zygomatic here and here. You have your maxilla, now let's do MX for the maxilla. Down here is your mandible, okay? You can also see bits of things like the sphenoid bone, so that would be this section in here, the sphenoid bone forming the IR I orbit. You'll also note that the zygomatic forms part of the I orbit, as does the frontal, the maxilla, lacrimal, and also the ethmoid, which is more difficult to see in this picture. All right, um, let's go back up to the frontal bone and look at two features. We have the supraorbital ridges and the supraorbital foramen. Now, the eye ridges um, are not really visible um, in particular in this picture. Um, you can see if, if this was like a real model, you would see that a, there would be a slight ridging of bone. Women's will be less noticeable. Men's are more noticeable. Some men, I mean, they're like practically Neanderthal with enormous brow ridges. Um, and those are formed by um, muscle attachments. Okay, so more muscular you are, um, the, the more of a ridge you'll have. All right, then you've got the supraorbital foramen. That's right here and right here. Okay, and you've got nerves and blood vessels that go through there. We learned those two features because eventually we're gonna be talking about muscles and nerves, and you need to know where they are in relationship to the skeleton. Okay, let's focus in on the eye orbit. I want to um, look at the lacrimal bone. So that's gonna come down here. Sorry, when this translates uh, or copies from PowerPoint into my um, iPad where I record the things, it doesn't always put the arrows in the right place. So the lacrimal bone is this little segment right down in here, okay? Uh, it's really tiny, not very noticeable. All right, now we have an open fissure right here, and this is called the supraorbital fissure. This is not where the optic nerve goes through. Remember, the optic nerve goes through the optic canals in the sphenoid, okay? What you have here are various cranial nerves that are gonna be moving the eye muscles, all right? Now let's look more closely at the nasal cavity. So right up here, you have the two sides of the nasal bone. Then what I want you to do is focus on this thing right here. That is going to be the perpendicular plate of the ethmoid. Okay, now we're going to look at the nasal conchi, which I think are incredibly cool bones. The um, two superior ones, the superior and middle are actually part of the ethmoid bone, and then the inferior is its own separate bone. Um, but what I really think is cool about this is the way these increase air turbulence within your nasal cavity, which gives you time to warm up the air, moisten it, clean it, and also smell it more. So this, this air turbulence is really important. Now, we've got three curls for the nasal conchi. We've got one here and basically one here. Same thing on this side here and here. And then this larger one down here, which is the inferior nasal concha, okay? Now I'm gonna switch colors to green so that I can highlight the vomer bone right down in here. Okay, so you've got three things that create the nasal septum. You've got the vomer, the, I'm gonna abbreviate this, perpendicular plate of ethmoid, and number three is gonna be the um, septal cartilage. All right, so that's just hyaline cartilage. When you pierce your nose, you're actually gonna put it through the cartilage. The bone is posterior or behind that septal cartilage. Now, did I miss anything on the list? Nope, it looks like I got everything, so let's go to the next slide. All right, the next couple of slides, we're gonna do some close-ups on bones. So right here, we are looking at the mandible bone, and 
this word right here, which the arrow did not um, go through well when it converted, that is your coronoid process. And that is actually this projection on the mandible. Okay, you need to know that. We also have the mandibular condyle. Now I've mentioned condyles before. They're telling you that you have an articulation. All right, and an articulation is a joint. It's where two bones come together. So I'll just write that down. All right, you may have heard of temporal mandibular joint, or you may be more familiar with TMJ disease. All right, and that's where basically someone gets inflammation in that joint, and then they have pain and stiffness when they're trying to chew. It can actually lock up. So the TMJ is right here. It's formed by the mandibular fossa, mandibular fossa plus the mandibular condyle. Okay, and you need to remember that the mandibular fossa is part of the temporal bone, whereas the mandibular condyle is part of the mandible. Okay, let's move on. All right, here we are looking at a medial view of the nasal cavity. So we've kind of cut away one half of it, and we're gonna be looking at the midline. All right, so I had mentioned the septum, all right? And the septum composed of three things, which I'm not gonna rewrite again because I think you have it from the previous slide. But let's look at this nasal cartilage. So that's right here, and that is gonna be hyaline cartilage, so it's nice and flexible. And when you get a nose ring, it's basically going through right there and then hanging out of your nose. Uh, unless, of course, you get it in the side and then it's just going through skin. Okay. Then you have the, let's see, let's look at different bones. We've got the maxilla coming up right here. And you can see that's all shaded in this tan color right in here. All right. We have the nasal conchi right here. So one, two which are part of the ethmoid, and three, which is its own separate bone, okay? We've got our nasal bone here. You can see the frontal bone and frontal sinuses. And then you've got the ethmoid structure. So you can see you've got the crystagalli, which is gonna have dura mater attaching to it in order to create it. You can see the holes, which is where the olfactory nerves go through on the cribriform plate. Okay, um, and they do not have the, um, uh, perpendicular plate showing. So we'll just skip that and go on to the next slide for that. We've got the sphenoid here along with the sphenoid sinus and then the lovely cella tersica where you have your pituitary gland sitting. Okay. You can also see the palatine bone, which is just this short little segment. Most of the palate is actually formed by your maxilla here. All right, it's only the very back portion, the very posterior portion that is formed by the uh, palatine bone, okay? Let's go ahead and look at the next slide. All right, this is very similar to the previous slide, but there's no nasal cartilage. So the nasal cartilage would have been right about here. So that has been removed. And what you can see better now is the vomer bone here, okay? You can see the nasal bone, and then you get a really nice view of the superior, middle, and inferior nasal conchi. Um, and this arrow should actually be here, not there. Oh, that's so frustrating when it does that. Um, Let's go ahead and move on to the next slide. All right, we're gonna look at the hyoid now really briefly. The hyoid is not technically part of the skull, but it's attaching sorta of up to it. The hyoid is neat in that it floats. It doesn't actually attach to any bone um, in the body. So it, it's basically gonna have these ligaments and muscles that are attaching it to various structures. And then, and then when you swallow, these things pull on this bone, and that ca causes a structure called the epiglottis to fold over, which prevents 
food and liquids from going into your um, into your lungs okay um, we've got these structures on the hyoid we don't emphasize those in this course so you don't have to know those what you do need to know is that that's the hyoid bone and basically where it's from and that it's involved in swallowing so I'll write swallowing here All right, on the next slide, we're going to quickly look at your perinasal sinuses. I have all of your summary information located right here. All right, in the body, we have uh, three paired sinuses plus the sphenoid sinus. So if you look at this right here, we have an anterior view, or this lady, and you can see these sinuses up in there. And how, have you ever had a sinus infection? All right, these sinus cavities are um, coated in a mucosa just like your nasal cavity and they communicate with your nasal cavity so that air and fluids that are in your nasal cavity and also your middle ear move back and forth with these other tissues and you can actually spread around infections but you can also spend more time warming up air and it also helps to lighten up the head and so you can see you've got the frontal here and then the side view it's there You've got your right and left ethmoid here, so there's ethmoid. All right, you've got your maxillary here, um, and then the single sphenoid, which you're not going to see in the anterior view. Okay. What I like to do is look at X-rays of these because they show up, and what's really cool is that each person's X-ray of their sinuses is unique to each individual person, so that you can actually identify um, someone from what their sinus pattern looks like on an x-ray. So say you have someone who had an x-ray done of their head and then, I don't know, five years later, their skull is found out in the woods somewhere. Well, you can take an x-ray of that dead skull and then compare it to previous x-rays and see if you can say that they're a pretty close match and that this is you know, probably that person. Um, of course, if you've got teeth, well, teeth are even better for identifying someone. So, but anyway, sinuses are cool. All right, in your lecture course, you're going to spend a lot more time looking at ossification. For the purposes of this lab, this is the information that you need to know, that you need to try and remember about these different types of bones when you're discussing them. So you need to know that intramembranous is made out of fibrous CT, whereas endochondral, endo, in, chondral, con, remember, chondro means cartilage, all right? That's made out of hyaline cartilage. So what parts of the skeleton are endochondral versus intramembranous? And I've just got that right here for you, okay? So you can look at that. And then why we use connective tissue or cartilage, it's because osteoblasts need something to put the minerals down on that will keep them in place. So they have to put down fibers in order to lay minerals down on the fibers in order to create the bone, okay? All right, so that was super brief. And the reason we're mentioning that is because I wanna talk really, really briefly about cranial growth which is gonna be mostly through intramembranous ossification, all right? The cranial vault, so the big part that's wrapped around your brain is gonna be made this way. And this is important because how it grows is, affects how a baby's head reacts to being born and some of the anatomical features that, that we look at and how these cranial sutures work when they go together, all right? So when an infant is born, they have parts of their bone that haven't turned to bone yet, the parts of the skull that hasn't turned to bone. We call these the fontanelles or soft spot. The two most famous ones are your anterior and posterior fontanelles. Let's look at those. All right, so you should be able to identify all of the structures from the adult on the infant with maybe like some exceptions of, well, the mastoid process hasn't really formed so that's where it would be in the future, okay? But you can see it's not really formed. But I have my parietal, I have the frontal, temporal, occipital, sphenoid, zygomatic, maxilla, mandible, nasal, lacrimal, there's some of the ethmoid, okay? 
So you should be able to identify all those. Now, what you'll also notice is that these sutures, so this is the squamosal suture. Look how big it is, lambdoidal. Those have a lot of tissue in them that haven't turned to bone yet, and that is because when the baby's head goes through the birth canal, it needs to be able to kind of squish and become a little bit smaller. So this allows these kind of potato chip-like bones to kind of squish and slide underneath each other. The same thing with the soft spots. So this is the anterior fontanelle, and right here is the posterior fontanelle, and it's easier to see on the view that's a superior view. So right here, okay? Now you may have heard of the soft spot on babies that you have to be careful of. Well, that's what this is. These are the soft spots. Another really interesting feature is that when our skulls form, we have a right frontal bone and a left frontal bone. In between them, we have the metopic suture. The metopic suture usually fuses all together by the time you're about one, but not always. Some adults retain the metopic suture and it'll show up in x-rays um, or older children. And no, it's not a skull fracture, it's just the metopic suture, okay? Um, the fontanelles are going to be the last areas to harden and that's gonna be at about one and a half to two years of age. So they'll become really tiny, but they'll still be there and then they'll eventually kind of go away and then you will just have your standard sutures of the adult, okay? Next slide. All right, so sexing skulls is just fun. Who doesn't want to find a skull in the woods and be able to tell if it's a boy or a girl? Well, if it's a boy or a girl, you're probably not gonna be able to tell. If it's a man or a woman or a male or a female adult, you, you might be able to tell. Um, sex and how it affects um, bones, it's a continuum, okay? So you have skulls and pelvis that look extreme male and then extreme female, and then you have others that are kind of at this ambiguous area in the middle. So it is very possible for somebody who um, is a forensic osteologist or a forensic anthropologist to find a skeleton and say they're male and then have it turn out that they're female or vice versa. But we can look at these generalized traits. Now what happens for the humans is that at puberty, males get an uptick in testosterone. Increased testosterone increases muscle mass, all right? Muscles pull on bones, all right? It pulls on bones, makes them bumpy. Makes them bumpy and big and chunky, okay? So over here, I've got a little table that kind of outlines how things change. So male brow ridges are heavier. Female brow ridges are smaller. So if you're looking over here, you can see the brow ridge right here is almost non-existent. Over here, it's a little bit bigger, okay? Um, probably my favorite feature is actually the chin. Females tend to have a pointy triangular chin, whereas males tend to have Superman chin that's really square and blocky. Um, the mastoid process, which we can't see on this, let's actually flip to the next slide where we can see some of these other traits. So the mastoid process is really fun. Um, the mastoid process is going to be considerably larger in the male right here and then smaller and more delicate in the female. Um, and let's see what else. Um, yeah, the, the eyebrow, so you can see here the ridging is bigger on the eyebrows here, e much easier. Over here you can see it's pretty delicate. All right, so those are some of the features that you can use. There's, there's actually more, but those are some of the easier ones to use for sexing the skull. All right, so that was the end of unit four, looking at the skull and bone tissue. And you can go on to unit five.